Chapter 2 Bad Money Very rarely do humans do bad things because they are bad people. Humans often commit immoral acts to fulfill what they believe is a need. It is a human need and the necessity to pay for all survival needs with money, which results in people doing things like cutting corners or taking the cheap way out when making a product. Poorly made products are a result of the human survival instinct that can only be satisfied with money. Many times, cutting corners can result in damaging the person who buys the product. A businessman who cuts corners does so all to save a few dollars or squeeze out a little extra profit. The businessman does not cut corners to cause injury to a customer, yet these types of actions often lead to an injury. For example, a thing such as good quality food and bad quality food should not exist. All food should be the same, good quality. However, a food company may decide to use pesticides to increase the number of apples they harvest, thereby allowing them to sell more apples and lose less to insects. That pesticide may have harmful side effects. The company then offers an organic version of the apple that does not have dangerous side effects and sells it for more than the one with pesticides. Now you have two different quality levels of the same product. The customer is now forced to eat a crappy apple if they want to save money. Some customers will not be able to afford the organic version of the apple, so they buy the regular apple. As a result, the customer develops allergies that increase their medical bills. The customer then takes the cheapest version of an allergy medicine they could find. As a result, the allergy medicine affects their hormones. The change in hormones causes a genetic defect in the customer's newborn baby. This scenario can go on and on, but at each turning point, the choice was made because the individual's survival was directly tied to how much money they had, and as a result, they tried to save a few or make a few extra bucks. Had the scenario been one in which the individual's survival needs were not tied to money or if the money itself was designed differently and optimized for health results, then it would be irrelevant to try and make a few extra dollars, save a few bucks, cut corners, or take the cheap way out. The only concern would be what is best for the product's end user. Since the farmer won't have to pay for his family's food or shelter with faulty, poorly designed money, there is no need to grow an apple that has harmful side effects in the first place. If you tell a human being that their very survival depends on them having a particular thing, it is the instinct of that human to accumulate as much of it as possible. Humans are not wired to just acquire the number of resources needed for their family's survival. Humans are built to get as much as humanly possible of a necessary thing. The strength of the human survival instinct is not based on the practicality of having enough, but on the feeling of having all needs met. This type of irrationality that an adequately designed money economic system that optimized the correct traits would control. Concepts such as owning land and water trigger competitive survivalist behaviors. How can a human own something that will exist much longer than human life? The idea of taking control of a piece of land or water and then charging another human a price for it is criminal in itself. The earth does not charge for using its land or water. Why then should one human charge another? Or a government tax a human for owning it? Poorly designed money then becomes a barrier to human survival and causes conflicts. All living things owe their survival to the land and water abundantly available on the earth. All that is required to survive on the planet is human labor and intellect. No one should own land. Instead, land should only be held by its primary users. 
Much worse than a human owning land is when a corporate entity owns the land. Corporations owning land creates the scenario whereby land is held only for profit by entities that do not use it directly while still being able to suck the benefits from it. This type of arrangement enslaves people. The entire concept of requiring proof of land ownership in the form of a deed is proof that the land in question is stolen land. Think about it. If the land indeed belonged to you, then everyone would know that it's your land because it has been in your family for generations. You and your family live on the land, so there is no reason to prove that you own it with a piece of paper. However, if you stole the land, you would need proof to protect yourself from other thieves stealing it from you. After all, there is no honor among thieves. Examine the following scenario. An invading force kills the inhabitants and takes their land. To avoid conflict among the invaders, there had to be a way to prove who a piece of land was awarded and a clear way for a court to settle if there was more than one claim to the same piece of land. The invaders, having left their homeland to seek out the land of others, will start a business or corporation around the use of the land to enrich themselves at the expense of the original inhabitants. The government would then make it their business to tax the profits gained by the corporation to fund the entire structure. A structure based on theft and greed. Many such corporations ruled countries as if they were governments. Corporations owning land is equivalent to banks borrowing at 0% interest and then lending the same money at 4% interest to borrowers. Corporations typically manage to get something for free and then charge others for it. An easy example would be Poland Springs, the water company. Water companies get fresh drinkable water freely from the earth, then bottle it and sell it for a profit around the world. Meanwhile, the United Nations World Water Development Report stated that nearly 6 billion people will suffer from clean water scarcity by 2050. The same thing happens with the 401k and pension plans. A custodian receives the employee's pay for free with strict penalties for the employee should they request their money back before retirement. Meanwhile, the custodian freely invests the employee's salary and enjoys the profits immediately, while only being obligated to return the employee a small portion of any profits many decades later. But if something goes wrong and the custodian mismanages the money, as was the case with the corporate giant Enron, the employees of Enron held nearly 60% of their retirement assets in company stock. As the company sank toward bankruptcy, Enron was changing plan providers, which prevented employees from selling shares. Simultaneously, Enron executives with personal holdings outside the 401k were unloading their shares. The company's executives defrauded their shareholders and employees out of $74 billion in life savings that they will never get back. Long before corporate giants like Enron, Apple, Google, or Amazon, the English East India Company was one of the biggest, most dominant corporations in history. It was incorporated by Royal Charter on December 31, 1600. It went on to act as a part trade organization and part nation state and reap vast profits from overseas trade with India, China, Persia, and Indonesia for more than two centuries. The Royal African Company, RAC, was an English mercantile trading company set up in 1660 by the Royal Stuart family and City of London merchants 
to trade along the west coast of Africa. It was led by the Duke of York, who was the brother of Charles II, and later took the throne as James II. It shipped more enslaved Africans to the Americas than any other company. The Hudson Bay Company, HBC, chartered on May 2, 1670, is the oldest incorporated joint stock merchandising company in the English-speaking world. HBC was a fur trading business for most of its history, a past entwined with the colonization of British North America and the development of Canada. The Dutch East India Company, 1602 to 1799, officially the United East India Company, was a multinational corporation founded by a government-directed consolidation of several rival Dutch trading companies in the early 17th century. It is believed to be the largest company ever in recorded history. The Dutch West India Company, or WIC, 1621 to 1791. The slave trade of the Dutch West India Company. Founded 400 years ago, the Dutch West India Company waged war at sea and colonized territories in West Africa and the Caribbean until its dissolution in 1791. The WIC not only traded in goods, but also in people. For the human ego, capitalism is attractive because it enables those who are strong enough to attain while cursing those who can't. It produces a polarizing effect that can only be enjoyed by part, but never by the whole. For this reason, people like me enjoy the challenge of capitalism because it is a eat-what-you-kill model that satisfies my ego. However, this kind of selfishness leaves large sums of the population without inheritance, doomed to feel the sting of poverty while wallowing in the bliss of ignorance. The alternative to the eat-what-you-kill model, capitalism, is the PAC model resource-based economy, where the inheritance is shared and invested in the people to ensure the future survival and continued improvement of the path. This would allow each generation to build into the collective equity of the previous, until millions of lifespans worth of human equity have been realized. This would enable each newborn earthling to be born debt-free we would be better off than our grandparents rather than worse off. This economic model could not work with the fiat-based money system, but blockchain technology-based money systems and some alternate and future iterations of cryptocurrencies could, especially when combined with decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs. The technology for this next evolution of money already exists.